the Bible says. Okay, we're going to see what the Bible really says. We're going to see what the Bible really says. Because today, today we're going to shake some things up. Today, uh, God had to shake me up. And I had to, I had to, uh, I had to go back and I had to allow God to, to shake off misunderstandings that I had. And when you read the Word of God, you have to read it in context. <clears throat> context is extremely important. And what we see throughout the Bible is consistency. And that's God is consistent. He is consistent in what He does. His Spirit is consistent. And here's the... Here's a definition of consist, consistent. Always acting or behaving in the same way. Always, huh? Consistent. Always acting or behaving in the same way. So, the last chapter, chapter 13, uh, 1, Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So, in chapter 13, that's the love chapter. That's where Paul talks about, um, if, if, you know, right before that, chapter 12, he gives, he gives a different... The different gifts of the Spirit. And then he goes on to say, if I can, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I don't have love, I'm, I'm like sounding gong and clinging symbol. And he goes on to say, if I can fathom all mysteries and have all knowledge, yet I don't have love. I, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. So here, um, he talks about the superior gifts. Now, now remember, God is a God of order. He is not a God of disorder. First Corinthians, First Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. God is a God of order, not a God of disorder. I think it's fascinating that there's only men in this class today. That's pretty funny. But but that's God. Maybe some of us need to hear. We, we need to hear what the women already know. Amen? Amen. So as Paul says this, he says, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. Underline that in your Bible. Why? Because each one of us should desire spiritual gifts. We're all born again with a gift or gifts when we get saved. But God wants us to pursue the spiritual gifts. Why? Because they're supernatural. They help you in uh, your ability to, to grow the church, to have authority over the enemy. Amen? So the spiritual gifts are there for a purpose because you can't do them in your natural, with your natural giftings. Most of us in the church, we think, man, that person can sing. What a gift. That's not a gift. That's a talent. That's a talent. Talents are different than spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts give you the ability to operate in the supernatural where there's no function in the natural. They go above and beyond what is natural. Amen? And Paul's going to talk about that when we speak different various kinds of languages or tongues. <clears throat> These are supernatural gifts. So it said, pursue love and despise, or excuse me, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. And above all, that you may prophesy, that you may prophesy. For the person who speaks in another language is not speaking to men but to God. Now there are three different types of tongues. When you go back to uh, to uh, first, or when you go back to Acts ch in chapter two, you can see that while they were in the upper room, this mighty rushing wind came, the Holy Spirit, and then the the, the tongues were like <coughs> fire above them, and they started speaking in the other languages of the people that were uh, that that came from other countries. That spoke various other languages. And as they were speaking in tongues, they were speaking the same native language of the people who were there for the feast of Pentecost. So it's like, for example, if I, if I, I know a pastor, and this pastor went to Russia, and he could not speak Russian. He had an interpreter. His interpreter didn't show up. God called him to preach a sermon in Russia. So the Holy Spirit came, to, came upon him, and he spoke perfect Russian. And he proclaimed the gospel in Russian. And then after he was finished, he couldn't speak Russian anymore. But that's one of the languages. It's a native language. That's the language on Pentecost. Amen? Amen. Everybody understand that? So that is a language that is interpreted. We can understand that language because people speak that language. And God will give you the ability. I was, I was listening to Perry Stone. And he said that he was ministering in Israel, not too far from the Mount of Olives. And there were some Arabs there that spoke Farsi, the Farsi language. He started ministering to them, speaking the Farsi language. And they have it on camera. The cameraman was like, this dude's speaking Farsi. He doesn't know Farsi. Okay, but he spoke Farsi. And he, and he even, even spoke a word of uh, knowledge to the guy. He said, you know, God wants to heal your heart, but you need to run to God. 
And sure enough, he went back to Israel and asked the cameraman, hey, did this guy, he said, yeah, he ran to God and his heart's healed. Isn't that awesome? You see that function in the church. It's powerful. So that's one of the ways that we speak in tongues. God gives us a, the ability to speak in another natural language, which is here on earth. I said, okay, but this language here says language is not speaking to men, but to God, since no one understands him. However, he speaks mysteries in the spirit. That is the prayer language that you speak when you are alone with the Lord. If you speak in tongues, if God's giving you this gift, because remember, it's a gift and it's the last one on the list. It's the last one on the, on the list of the gifts, speaking in tongues and an interpretation of tongues. If you speak that language, you don't understand what you're saying. Why? Because it's a heavenly language. It edifies your spirit. It edifies you. That's another one. So we have the native languages that God has given at the Tower of, ba Tower of Babel. Okay, God, God gave those languages to men. That's one of the languages. That's one of the gifts. That you have the ability to speak a language that you were not born <coughs> speaking. Or you didn't learn when you grew up. You can be multilingual in the spirit. Okay, that one. And then the private language that you speak, which is a language that you cannot understand. When I speak in tongues, I have no clue what I'm saying. When I'm praying, I have no idea what I'm saying. But does God know? Yes, God does know. I personally believe that the devil does not know that language. Why? Because it's a direct communication between you and the Spirit of God. That way the devil can't come in and, and, and uh, send fun, funny signals to God or he send funny, funny signals to you. Why? Because it's a language he can't grasp. Now remember that... What's that? Like straight communication. Direct communication. Amen. But remember, the devil is a counterfeiter. Whenever we, uh, whenever we experience people that have some demonic possession, sometimes they speak other languages. That is not earthly. But it is not the same type of tongues that you use. It's a demonic form of tongues. Why? Because the devil is a counterfeiter. He wants to counterfeit what God does. Because he's, ne he's never come up with a new idea, has he? No, he hasn't. Nothing is new under the sun, especially for him. Verse 3, but the person who prophesies speaks to people for edification, encouragement, and consolation. Okay, that's very, very important. The person who speaks in another language builds himself up. That's that personal prayer time language that God's given some people. But he who prophesies builds up the church. Would you rather be building up yourself? And be the only one edified, or would you rather come into the, the house of God and everybody gets fooled? Why? Because one person is less effective than everybody else. When everybody else is on fire for God, the church will grow. Amen? The church will definitely grow. Listen to what he says this. He says, I wish all of you spoke in other languages, but even more that you prophesied. Okay? I, there's people who actually believe that unless you speak in tongues, you don't have the evidence of being born again. That is not found in the Word of God. If you go over to chapter 12, verse 11, it says this. It says, but one and the same Spirit is active in all these. And, he's, and right before that, he gives all the nine gifts of the Spirit. Distinct, dis, dis, distributor, distributing to each person as he wills. Who is the one who distributes them? The Holy Spirit. So he gives this person a gift after you're born again. It could be tongues. Who knows? After this, he gives a person who might prophesy. To this one, he gives the wisdom, miracles. All these things are for the body of Christ. And then he goes on in that chapter to say, are all hands or all feet? No. God distributes these different gifts to each person to complete the whole body. Without two feet, you can't walk. If you notice, when you walk, you use your arms. Have you noticed that? Try to run without using your arms. You're not as fast as you are when you use your whole body. You stub your toe, you'll know that toe is there for a purpose because it throws off your balance. Mm -hmm. God puts and gives gifts, distinct gifts. Remember it says this, that He personally, Jesus personally gave you these gifts. Personally chosen for you. Amen? Amen. But the, the person who prophesies is greater than the person who speaks in languages unless interpretate unless interpret so that the church may be built up. Okay, that's the third one. He mentions three different types of languages here. 
The, the first language is the personal edification, which is your prayer time with God. That is an angelic language that the devil cannot understand. That's my personal opinion about the, the language itself. Okay, the next one is a, is a language that is built to edify the body of Christ. God puts a word in a person who has the gift of tongues. And then he also exercises a gift for the person who is to interpret the tongues. People that have the gift of tongues and the gift of interpretation, you can have both. I know somebody that has both those gifts. And they've operated, they've operated that in our ministry. So if, if the Lord puts a word in me and I have that gift and I have got to get it out, there has got to be an interpreter there. Because if I stand up and I'm in an English service and I start speaking Chinese, people are going to be like, Oh, I've got to edify the, the body. You know, you know, and people are like, that's not edifying. That's stupid. But if I, if I stand up with a word specifically for the church, because there are angels in the church, there are angels in this church, who were specifically designated for Christian life center. If I stand up and speak a word to edify the body of Christ, and there is an interpreter there, then the church gets edified. Amen? The church can be motivated to do something that God has been wanting to tell the church, so it comes through us by the Spirit. Amen? Verse 6. But now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in other languages... How will, I, how will I benefit you unless I speak to you with a revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? And that's like I was saying a second ago. If I say something and it's meaningless, nothing happens. But if I give you a word of prophecy or exhortation that motivates you to get out there and preach the gospel, or there's something that God's been trying to speak to you and you're just too stubborn to listen or something that, that you know, Lord, if I, if, you know what, God, I need to hear from you today. And then God speaks to you, then you get motivated to do what he's called you to do. Then that, that is productive. But just babble, babble is not productive. It doesn't do anything. But something, well, let's keep going. Uh, verse 7. Uh, Even inanimate things that produce sounds, whether flute or harp, if they don't, make a distinction in the notes how will how will what is played on the flute or the harp be recognized if I've, I've used this example before too let's say I get up there and I just start getting a simple and that's it I mean who's going to come to church to hear a simple right but when you choreograph it with all the other instruments and they're all playing the notes at the proper time Oh, then you have a symphony. Then you have something much greater. Why? Because it's, there's a purpose there. There's a purpose there. Verse 8. In fact, if the trumpet makes an unclear sound, who will prepare for battle? In the same way, unless you use your tongue for intel, 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 uh, intelligible speech, how will what is spoken be known? Or it's just babble. For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different kinds of languages in the world. Chinese, Spanish, Portuguese, whatever. And all have meaning. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker will be a foreigner to me. The gospel doesn't change. There's no doubt about it. I can speak the gospel in the Chinese <clears throat> to a Chinese person, and they'll get it. Right? But if I speak English to a Chinese person, even though the gospel hasn't changed, they're not going to get the gospel. Why? Because I'm not speaking their language. Correct? Right. But when I use their language and God gives me that supernatural gift, then they'll get it. Why? Because I'm speaking their language. So at this point, you have three different types of languages. The angelic language is personal. The, uh, the language that is said for a, for, to, be, to be edifying the church with an interpreter. And then the language that is used to a foreigner, which the, is a language that I'm not born with. But I get up and I start speaking perfect Spanish to somebody that speaks Spanish. That's the three languages. Okay? Two of them are angelic or heavenly. The first one is your personal. The next is to edify the body. And the next one is actual is an actual native language that the person that you're giving it to, God supernaturally indwells you to speak in that language, which you do not have the, your own ability to do. It is a supernatural gift. Amen? Powerful. Praise God.
Verse 12. So also you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, seek to excel in building up the church. It's very important to be zealous for God and spiritual gifts. Therefore, the person who speaks in another language should pray that he can interpret. For if I pray in another language, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What then? I will pray then the spirit, and I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with the spirit, and I will also sing with my understanding. Otherwise, if you praise with the spirit, how will the uninformed person say amen? They've got to understand what you're saying. At your giving of thanks, since he does not know what you're saying. For you may very well be giving thanks, but the, earth, but the other person is not being built up. Why? Because they don't understand what you're saying. If I get up, put a shit to the, you know, I start speaking tongues, but the other person's like, why do you think people freak out when they hear people speaking in tongues? Because it, it's not, it doesn't, uh, their spirits can't receive it because it's not, they're not born again. And you know what else? I'll be honest with you. Unfortunately, in the church, this has been this has been uh, not only misunderstood, and it, it bugs me because I mean it's right here, black and white. But the problem is, is that when somebody, even if it's a pastor, they get up and they start speaking tongues, and no one interprets it, that's out of order. That is completely out of order with, with what the Bible says. But when it's done the correct way, God uses it uses it with the purpose to edify the body of Christ. People are afraid of tongues. Why? Because people have done what? They put such an emphasis on you have to speak in tongues unless you don't. And I've, I've had that happen to me. Somebody told me, you know, hey, do you speak in tongues? No. Well, you can't be a teacher here in this church. I'm like, what? I can't teach Sunday school? No, because you don't speak in tongues. And fortunately, a more mature person came and said, hey, hey hold on, brother. You know, she just got saved. I'm, I apologize. She's She's not really aware of what the Bible says. Okay. okay. All right? So speaking in tongues is, is it's just it's a gift. It's one of the gifts that the Spirit decides to give to whoever He wants. But should you desire that gift? Absolutely. Why? Because that's exactly what Paul said. But remember, desire the more the gifts that are higher than, the, than these lower gifts. Why? Because they produce more fruit. They produce more things. Again, would you rather want to edify one person or the whole body of Christ? You want to do the whole. You want to go and do the whole body of Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. I have a question, Pastor Don. Yes, sir. Let's just uh, say somebody's praying for you, and then all of a sudden they start praying in tongues, and nobody interprets that. How does that? That's a, that's a no-no. That's a no-no. Well, well, then, then, I mean, I'm not saying this. Well, the Bible just, says yeah. it's a no-no. Yeah. Because I've had that happen. I've, I've, been, I've laid my hands on people, and they just want to bust out. And they told me, I want to speak in tongues. I said, do you have an interpreter? And they're well, like, no. Well, what about the ones praying for you? It, I think that should be done silently. When, yeah. I, when I pray in tongues, I keep it very, very low. Very low. Why? Because I'm, I'm speaking a heavenly language. But, I, but again, I don't have an interpreter to speak what I'm saying. Right. And it's a language that I, I've, I've often spoke before, unless God loosens my tongue to speak a different, you know, some more. But for the most part, well, let's just read what God's right. verse says, and, and you'll see. Verse 18, I think, listen to this. <laughs> verse 18, I thank God that I speak in other languages more than all of you. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding in order to teach others also than 10,000 words in another language. Let's say you are praying for somebody and you start speaking in tongues. Does that person know what you're saying? No. And they walk away dumbfounded. Well, I don't really feel anything. But if God gives you a word for that person that's specifically designated for that person to hear that that person did not tell you about, Whatever it is that person's going through, and you speak that word to them, that could change everything. One word. If you say one, and I've done that. I've said a word to somebody, and I'm like, how do you know that? I said, hey, I just said, telling you what I heard. But if I, if I sit there and I start speaking tongues over that person, and they have no idea what I'm saying to them. You see how that works? 
But if you give them a word, because Paul said, I, I, speak to, I speak in languages more than all of you. But he said, I'd rather speak five, five words that people can understand than 10,000 words in, the, in, in tongues. Amen? Doesn't it? Yeah, but it's unfortunate that the church has misunderstood this. Verse 20, brothers, don't be childish in your thinking. And that's the problem with the church. We become childish. But be infants in regard to evil and adult or mature in your thinking. It is written in the law. I will speak to those people by people of other languages and by the lips of foreigners. And even then, they will not listen to me. Even if the gospel is preached in another language, but to someone else who doesn't have that language or that ability, but supernaturally has it, maybe they're not going to listen. Just sometimes they're just not going to listen. It says the Lord. Verse 22. It follows that speaking in other languages is intended as a sign not to believers, but for unbelievers. The day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Let's go there. Acts chapter 2, verse 5. You have to... You have to read the Bible in context, but you also have to interpret the Bible with the Bible. That's the best way to do it. Acts chapter 2, verse 5. I'm getting it. All right. There were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. When the sound occurred, that's the Holy Spirit falling in the upper room, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Okay? And then, and then uh, he goes on to say the different places that these people were from. They did not speak the language of the people that were in the upper room. They were foreigners. They came to the they came to Pentecost because it was a festival, and they're at this festival, and all of a sudden they hear this this sound like a mighty like a tornado, and just like when you see somebody in school that's they fight fight fight. What does everybody do? They run to where the fight is because they want to view it. They want to see it. Okay, so these people run, and they hear the people, the 120 people in the upper room speaking in the language that they were born with. Okay, and then they said, you know, I, I perceive, I mean, this is, something's going on, because these, language, these people are speaking my languages, but they're doing it in the accent of people from Galilee. They're doing it with the accent from people of Galilee. Amen? So that's the language that he's talking about there. It's a language that you were not born with, yet God gave you the ability, or the gift, to speak that language. Amen? And those people, guess what? Those people got saved. Why? Because they heard the gospel in their language. More sister. They heard the gospel in their language. So what are what are tongues for? Or what is this what is this type of tongue for? To save people. To get people saved. Amen? Amen. So it's not for believers, it's for unbelievers. If I stand up here and start speaking German to you, what are you gonna do? Like, uh, that's an ugly language, you know. You know, <laughs> I don't like that German language. Give him a drink. <laughs> yeah, give me a drink, amen. All right, it's not going to edify the body of Christ, but it's going to edify someone who's German and who doesn't know know English. Uh, we're in uh, chapter fourteen of First Corinthians, system. but prophecy is not for unbelievers, but for believers. Why? Because we get it. Because God will give you a word when you need it, when you're down. God will speak to you. He'll motivate you to do what you need to do. Therefore, if the whole church assembles together, now listen to this, the whole church assembles together and all are speaking in other languages. This sounds like a contradiction, but it isn't. If all are speaking in, un, uh, in other languages and a non-believer or uninformed come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind or you're crazy? What in the world? Okay, why? Oh, praise God, I just got an awesome revelation. Now remember, I was saying this earlier. The church has misunderstood tongues. Let's say I invite somebody to my church that's never gone to church. Okay? And we have people speaking in all different tongues. Okay? Praying for people in tongues. Mm -hmm. When I come into that church, I'm going to be like, Man, this is a nice church. What are you doing? Hey, I'll see you at work. 
I'm not going to come back to that church. Why? Because it sounds like confusion. It sounds like utter confusion. Doesn't it? The first time I went into a Pentecostal church, with my boyfriend, he said, well, go ahead, my mom said, well, I got in there and they were receiving the Holy Ghost and people were falling out and talking in tongues. Man, I ran. Yes. I, I don't know who all I tackled on the way. Why? Because it wasn't done correctly. It scared me. It scared me. It wasn't done. Remember, God is a God of order, not a God of disorder. If you go into a place and everybody's running around speaking in tongues and there's no interpretation, you're going to think you're in a crazy world. Aren't, are you not? Because there's no one there to give you what to say what they're saying. True? Amen. Listen to what else he says. But if you are prophesying and some unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convicted by all and is judged by all. Listen to this. Uh, the secrets of his heart will be revealed. And as a result, he will fall face down and worship God, proclaiming, God is really among you. You walk into a church service and literally the power of God is there. People are getting healed. People are getting saved and prophesying and speaking words of truth. That person that is a non-believer who thinks the church is hokey is going to walk in and the truth is going to affect him so much to the power he is going to fall on his face and say, God is real. Amen. God is real. Because you know what? God has given us some of those gifts. When we speak to somebody, God reveals something to us. And we don't do it with judgment. Well, we do it with love. Love always comes first. When, when you have the gift of knowledge, when God gives you our prophecy and you speak it on your own behalf or you speak it out of selfish motivation, there's no profit there. But when you do it, when you're compelled by the love of God, that people, those people get affected. They get changed. Do they not? They do. Why? Because it's God's love working through you. The Bible says that God knows the number of hairs on your head. Not a sparrow can fall to the ground without the knowledge of God. Yet you are more important to God than a bird. So God will speak to a, a believer, to a non-believer, and give them a word that they need to hear. To say, how did you know that? Well, mm -hmm. God spoke it to me. <coughs> nah, you, you've been reading my, my text. No, I haven't. God spoke this to me to share it to you. Why? Because he wants to show you how much he loves you. Mm -hmm. Where do you go to church? Yeah, what time does your service start? Oh, yeah, you got that real good Bible teacher, Pastor Don. Oh, yeah, I'll be there. <laughs> I just had to throw that in there. Good, perfect time. <clears throat> All right. Okay, what then? This is verse 26. What then? In conclusion, brothers, whenever you come together, each one has a psalm, a teaching. Or listen to this. It's very important. Has a psalm, a teaching, a revelation, another language, or an interpretation. All things must be done for edification. Okay, that is, listen to me very closely, that's how our church should function every time we come into a meeting. People should be doing what? Should be, we should sing, amen, we do that. We should sing a psalm, that's a hymn. We should have a teaching, we're doing that. Have a revelation, now it gets kind of fuzzy. Another language, or an interpretation. That's how the, the church should be functioning every time we meet. Why? Listen to me very closely. Most people do not know their spiritual gifts in the church. Amen. Period. And if you don't know what your spiritual gift is, guess what? You will not be willing to use it. Why? Because you don't know what it is. But when you know the gift that God has given you and you are functioning in that gift properly, oh man, oh, oh man. I had Brother Tony come up to me and said, Brother... We had a service. He said, I, I, I feel like I need to speak or I have a word for these two gentlemen. Do you mind if I say the word? Absolutely. You are not out of order. You are in complete order. If God has unctioned you to do that, we let him happen. And, it, and guess what? Those guys fell on their face, didn't they? Those two men that came fell down on their face. And they said, God is real. Guess what? The Bible, what it said, happened. He had a word for them that spoke directly to them from God, and they fell on their face and worshiped God at that, that, that night. Amen? Amen? And here's saying the same thing. People are not functioning in their gifts. And guess what? The church is broken because of it. And I'm speaking about the, whole ch the church in whole. If you don't know what your gift is, guys, let's work on finding out what your spiritual gift is. Why? Because God gave it to you when you got saved. Singing is not a spiritual gift. I'm sorry. 
Okay, worship is not a spiritual gift. It is it is a an, an uh, overflow of what God has given you. Why would you worship something you don't believe? You worship God who's changed you, who's affected you. Absolutely, that's a talent. But when you flow and operate in the in the gifts, in the church is going to be powerful. The problem is, is most of us don't know where our giftings are. So let's work on it. Find out what your gift is. We're going to work on it. We ask how we find out what the gift is. Okay, we'll go back and I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll learn there's nine gifts in all, nine spiritual gifts. And each one of us has one or more. One or more, some of them have all of them. You see Peter and Paul functioning in all these gifts the way Jesus did. Okay? Some of us have all of them. Amen? Amen. And what, is, what does he say? Desire spiritual gifts. Verse 1 of chapter 14. Desire spiritual gifts. Listen to this. If any if any person speaks in other languages, there should there should be only two or three. Now he's breaking down what should happen in a church meeting at this point. Now remember, if you turn or if you look in uh, in First Corinthians chapter seven verse one, don't go there. Now remember, Paul is answering. He's answering a letter that was sent to him. He is responding to a letter that was sent by the Corinthian church. He's responding. Amen? Now remember, God is a consistent God. Everybody say consistent. 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 What does that mean? Always acting or behaving in the same way. He is consistent throughout the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament. He never. The Bible says He doesn't change. He is the same today, yesterday, and forever. He is, not, he is unchanging. His nature is unchanging. Amen? So Paul is starting... To tell us how the, sh the church service should function in a meeting. If any person speaks in another language, there should be uh, there should be one, only one or two, or at the most three. Each in turn, so they have to take turns. And someone must, everybody say must, must, must interpret. If you have a tongue and there's not an interpreter, be quiet. Period. Be quiet. Verse 28. But if, but if there is an interpreter, that person should keep silent. But excuse me. But if there is not, if there is no interpreter, that person must keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. There's that personal edification of the of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and you have the gift of tongues. No interpreter. That's for you. You keep it to yourself. Amen. Two or three prophets should speak. And the others should evaluate. So the prophets speak. That's not an interpretation needed there. Why? Because they speak in the language that you're speaking. Amen? If I get up and say a, a, a word in English, you understand it, right? Why? That's a prophecy. As I speak to you now, you are receiving prophecy. As Pastor Rodriguez speaks, he receives prophecy and gives it to you. I can't tell you countless. Every time I speak or every time I teach... God gives me something to give to you that I don't have in my, my notes. It's like the revelation I told you a minute ago. Okay, that's from God. That's a, that's a, prop, a prophetic word for you. Amen? Now, remember, the prophecy is this a spontaneous word that God gives for the edific, edification of the church. Okay? Spontaneous. Boom. Okay? When you look at the Old Testament, you see the prophets. The Lord, like Jonah, the Lord told Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach to them. Instruction is coming. He ran the other way. That was a prophetic word. Okay? But when he went back, he still spoke that prophetic word. It still came out of him. Didn't it? Yes, it did. And as we speak, God will give me, or whoever, if I have the, if you have the gift of teaching, he will give you spontaneous words. The Holy Spirit will give you a word that somebody needs to hear at that moment. I'm not thinking it, but God is thinking it about you. Amen? Amen. And all these gifts are for the edification of the body. When we get to heaven, are you going to need to speak in tongues? No. Are you going to need to prophesy? No. Are you going to need a, the, uh, a word of wisdom? No. Why? Because it, at that time, the perfect will come. You'll be in heaven. We need these supernatural, heavenly spiritual gifts on earth, not in heaven. But here on earth, why? To move, to motivate, and to carry the church to do what God's called it to do. We've got to find what our giftings are. Why? To have a church service like this. Amen? I got one amen. I got one amen. God is amen. Amen. God is amen. You are the church. You are the church. And it's time to start functioning. Not relying on our talent or our ability. But to 
supernatural gifts that God has given us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Verse 30, but if something has been revealed to another person sitting there, the first prophet should be silent. Remember, God is a God of order. For you can, for, listen to this, for you can all, everybody say all. 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 For you can all prophesy one by one so that everyone may, may learn and everyone may be encouraged. That word all is very important because we're going to go back to it in a minute. Remember, God is a God of order. God is a God of consistency. When you hear the word all, does it mean only the men? Does it mean only the women? What does it mean? It means everybody. Everybody. Now remember, Paul is writing this letter in response to the questions that were asked him by the Corinthian church. He said, regarding the matters in which you wrote me about, these are the answers to those questions. Okay? What do you, what do you know about the law? And the, way, the way Jesus thought about the law of man. And the, way Pete, and the way Paul thought about the law of man. What do you know about that? He couldn't stand it. Jesus said, you know what? You regard your law. In other words, that's a rabbinical law. There is a book besides the Bible that the, rabbi, that the rabbis wrote down. And it's their interpretation of what the Bible says. Okay, it's their interpretation of what the Bible says. Jesus was so frustrated and so agitated because the Pharisees and the lawyers would put that law above the law of God. When Eve, and when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, God put a curse on humanity, right? But mm -hmm. what did Jesus do to the curse? Mm -hmm. He removed the curse. One of those curses was on Eve, wasn't it? Yes. Okay? That curse is gone. Amen. She would have to be in complete submission to who? To Adam. That curse is gone. Amen. God wants to shake some of your thinking up. But no, you should say amen. Because a lot of us, <laughs> and I'm glad there's more women in here. Okay? <clears throat> but listen to me very closely. God had to shake me up to, to help me to understand what he's talking about. Okay? God is consistent. You see that in the Old Testament as well as the New. He knew that when Eve and Adam were going to sin, that the curse would eventually be broken by Christ himself. He knew that. So are women still cursed? Are women still? No! Absolutely not. So he's getting ready to talk about a curse that is no longer there. Remember what verse 30 says? But if someone has revealed, oh, excuse me, verse 31, for you can all prophesy. Guess where you're going to be prophesying? In the church. You're going to be prophesying in the church. Men and women, whoever has a spirit is going to prophesy in church. In order for someone to prophesy, what do they have to do? They've got to speak. They've got to speak. So this does not... It contradicts the next verse. Listen to what verse 32 says. Hold on. Actually, uh, verse, verse 30, 30, I'm going to read it. Verse 32. And the prophet's spirits are under the control of the prophets, since God is not a God of disorder, but a God of peace. He is a God of order, is he not? Okay, so what? Who's going to be prophesying? Everybody. Males, females, whoever God puts the Spirit on. Correct? But listen to this verse, and this is where people get it wrong. As in all churches. Now this is a response to what he had already said. Now in all the churches of the saints, the women should be silent in the churches. How can they be silent if they're prophesying? Amen. How can you be silent and God's given you a word to edify the body of Christ and you can't speak? Why? Because women should shut up. I'm being serious. That completely contradicts the verse before that, does it not? Amen. And the church has misunderstood for years and years and years. That's why women have been held down. And it's so sad that the people that are not Christians look at the church and they think, well, the, the church doesn't. The, the church holds women back. They can't be preachers. True? True. But that's not what Jesus came to do. The Bible says that he came to, to do what? To free us from the curse. Amen. 
We should be preaching this in a way that, that people, they, they get it. No, 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 no. When the, woman that, the, when the woman came to Jesus at the well, she told him, you know what? You shouldn't be speaking to me because I'm a woman. And you shouldn't be speaking to me because I'm a Samaritan. Did that stop Jesus from speaking to her? No. no. And guess what? She became an evangelist. She said, hold on a second. And she went back to her house and she brought all the rest of the Samaritans with her and said, guess what? I met a man who knew everything about me. Everything that I've ever done. I want you to come and meet him. She became an evangelist for Jesus. Did Jesus tell her, oh, no, 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 no. You're a Samaritan. You're a woman. Do not go preach. No, 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 no. Do not tell anybody about me. Don't do it. Don't do it. No. He didn't do that. What did he, he do? He said, man, go get him. Get him and bring him back. Get him and bring him back. Amen? Amen. God is consistent throughout his word. When Samuel was sent to get a true king, God said, I want to choose a man that is after my own heart. And he saw Jesse's oldest son standing before him, and he said, oh, behold, the Lord's anointing stands before me. And God, what did God do? He said, uh-uh. He said, I'm not a man like you. He said, I do not judge a person by his appearance, but I judge a man by, or a person, a man of humankind, mankind, by his heart. Do you think God's going to say, you know what, man, you got a great heart, but you know what, you're a woman. <laughs> you do, you know, I can't, I can't find one man to do what you want to do, but you're a woman. I just, I just can't do this. Not going to happen. <clears throat> what does the Bible say? There's therefore now no Jew, no Greek, free or slave, male or female. Amen. We are all, all, there's that word again, all of us are one in Christ. We have been liberated. Every one of us as a believer has been liberated. That means set free from the curse. Those curses are no longer here. This does not apply to people in the New Testament. But the church has got it wrong. And I don't, I, you know what, I don't think, I know Pastor Rodriguez as far as I know. He, oh, he, excuse me, I know he's done it. I, he's had women come and speak. Right? Do they keep silence? Do they just stand up there and speak sign language to us? No. They preach to men. Don't they? Why? Because the church has got it wrong. He's got it right. Doesn't he? Amen? Amen. Mm -mm. Man, that, I mean, my heart is on fire right now. So, as in all the churches of the saints, the women should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be submissive, as the law also says. Okay, he's what is he talking about? He's talking about the law of man, not the law of God. Where does it say in the Old Testament women are not allowed to speak? I don't, I don't think it's in there. I've never read it. Women should not speak. They should shut up. Put some tape over their mouth. <laughs> hey, that's basically what we're, the church is saying. The Bible says to rightly divide the word of truth. Rightly divide the word of truth. When you read it in context, when you see the consistency of God, then you can rightly divide the word of truth. Amen? Women have been held down because of these two. You know, think about this. Think about this. We've got a couple of verses in the, in the, in the New Testament. There are 66 complete books in the, in, the, in the Bible. 39 in the Old, 27 in the New. And you know what? We throw all of the consistency that God has shown us throughout all those, all those, uh, all those uh, chapters and verses for a couple of verses and say, well, no, women aren't allowed in the club. Sorry. Can't do it. Is that God? No. What's the saying? Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater? That's basically what we've done. We've said, you know, and again, God had to shit me up on this. But he had to reveal some things to me first. He had to get some wrong thinking off of me before I, why? Because my wife's a preacher. My wife's a pastor. She's a minister. How dare me say, oh, you got to sit down, baby. I got this. You're not supposed to be doing this. She's like, oh, get out of my way. God's what God's called me to do. And we thought about this. But I wasn't thinking right. How dare me?
How dare me stop her from doing what God's called her to do? So God said, you know what? Brother, I love you. I love you so much. But I want to have to spank you a little bit so you'll get this. And that spanking hurt. But after the pain went away and the tears went away, then I could see clearly. It's like, wow. Wow. Lord, I'm, I had to repent. Lord, I'm so sorry. And the church probably needs to repent too because we've held so many women back from answering the call of God. Amen? Verse 35. And if they want to learn something, they should ask their own husbands at home. For it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church meeting. Did the word of God originate from you or did it come to you only? So right now at this point, he's almost mocking them. Brother. Yes, ma'am. Can I read what the old yes, go King for James it. says? Please. Which is really horrible. It says, <laughs> and, if they, and if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. That's not God. And, but, but the next verse corrects it. Yes. Because Paul does this. Like, yeah, he almost mocks him. And he said, hold on a second. You're saying that you know the word of God and the law more than I do? I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. How dare you? Who do you think you are? You remember when he told the Galatian church? He said, you foolish Galatians. You foolish people. You get, you get, you get, you get uh, just... <clears throat> Uh, carried away with another form of doctrine. That easy. He said, if any man, he said, even if an angel comes to you and preaches another gospel other than one I preach to you, they are an abomination. And he says it twice. But he said, y'all, so you just easily got swayed by another form of doctrine. So there, he is giving them a response to what they said. So they're saying women shouldn't preach. Women shouldn't teach. Women shouldn't even talk. And he's saying, to who do you think you are? Do you think you know God's law better than I do? Do you know who was supposed to be the high priest? Paul. But Paul became a Christian. So, <laughs> guess what? He be, you know what? What happened to Paul for three years? Paul went away for three years and went to Arabia. Guess what? Because God had to shake the law and the curse off of him to teach him grace. Who do you think understands grace more than, than, than Paul? Nobody. Why? Because God directly revealed the revelation of grace to him to give to us. Amen. So he took him three years to shake the religiosity, the religious the religiosity off of him. Three years. God had to shake him and say, Grace, grace, for it's by grace that you have been saved. And he had to make him blind so he could see. Yes, he had to make it blind so we could see. Those who, who we have to live by faith, not by sight. Amen. We're no longer cursed. The curse has been gone because of Jesus. His blood abolished the curse. Amen? Amen. Or did the word, or did it come to you only? No. Verse 37, if anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual he should recognize that what I wrote to you is the Lord's command. But if anyone ignores this, he will be ignored. Therefore, my brothers, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in other languages. He is talking to everybody. The word all means all, all the time. If he would have, if he would have said, except the women. Except the women. He doesn't do that. He does not do that. All means all, all the time, period. Therefore, my brothers, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in other languages. But everything must be done with what? Decently, Decently and in order. The church has been out of order for a very, very long time. And it's got to come back into order because God is a God of order, not disorder. And the church has got it wrong, unfortunately. I've been to churches where I have got to get out of there because it's, you hear all these people speaking in tongues and no one can understand them. And it does sound like a crazy house. Okay? Because they put such an emphasis on the least gift and they ignore the greater gifts. 
Amen? Amen. So what? Guess what? We have to find out what our giftings are. Amen? Not our talents, but our giftings, because all are born again with gifts. We've got to find out what those are and start using them in the church. Using them in the body of Christ. Using them in the meetings. Amen? Amen. It is so awesome when the church functions that way. You, you won't leave the church the same. Some of you come in here, you feel one way, and you leave the same way. But God doesn't want that. He wants you to leave out of here like empowered. Empowered with His presence. Empowered by His Spirit. Amen? But if, you got, if you're a lady and you got tape over your mouth, what power do you have? None. Because people with misunderstanding have held you back and held you down. But not God. Tell that to Deborah, a judge. Tell that to Ruth. Tell it to Esther. Oh, you know what? You can't. No, you know what? You can't save the Jews. Why? Because you're a woman. Not going to happen. Somebody stick a piece of tape over her mouth. She's talking. Oh, no. No, God says what? Or her, her uncle told her, I believe that you have been sent here for such a time as this. This is your time. He didn't send a man to do that. He sent a woman to save the, is the, to save the Jews. He sent a woman to do that. That's a little clever, too. God wants to use whoever is willing. Kids, teenagers, old folks, like those other old folks, not us. You know the other ones? Women. And it's time for the church to wake up. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Did you under, does everybody agree with what I just said? With what, I, what the Bible says? Do you agree with it? Did some of you did some of you get some revelation in that? Praise God. That's what it's for. God reveals some things to you. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you for my, my brothers and sisters. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you. May the Lord give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Imagine if you had the gift of healing and you didn't, and someone was there that needed to be healed. But you said, no, I'm a lady. I better not do anything. Shame on you. Shame on you. Why? Because you should have operated in your gifts. And it's shame on the person that told you that you couldn't do it. The Bible said, Jesus said this. He said, it would be better if that person would have a millstone tied around their neck and thrown into the ocean than them to lead one of these little ones astray. Remember what, what Paul said there. He said, be infants in your, in your thinking. 